We're hearing more from the Christian Bible than we usually do in most UU services today. Uh, but Fred Rogers was an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, and he was deeply influenced by his Christian faith. And uh, the reading that I'm about to give, you will see how this ties in later in my sermon. This is Matthew 25, 31 through 43. It's uh, also called the parable of the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then will, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angel, angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it for the, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I was born in the early 1970s at the advent of groundbreaking children's programming on public television. So Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood were staples of my early childhood education. Like most viewers as I grew older, those shows faded into pleasant memories of simpler times. However, in the late 2000 teens, I realized I was hearing more and more about Mr. Rogers again. Fred Rogers died in 2003, but in 2018, the full-length documentary film on Rogers' life, Won't You Be My Neighbor, was released, as was the New York Times best-selling biography, The Good Neighbor, The Life and Work of Fred Rogers. The following year saw the release of the feature film, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, starring Tom Hanks as Fred Rogers, based on the true story of Roger's unlikely friendship with self-described bad boy Esquire journalist, Tom Junid. Social media shares of the video of Roger's Nixon era testimony before to save public television rated, as did memes with Roger's famous exhortation to look for the helpers in times of trouble. It does not take rocket science to determine the reason for the resurgence of interest in Fred Rogers. From the 2016 presidential campaign on, American media viewers were bombarded daily with messages of exclusion of those considered other and a distorted caricature of masculinity based on the denigration of those perceived as weak, including women, sexual minorities, and individuals with disabilities. It was as if Americans, disturbed by this daily onslaught of bullying, suddenly collectively discovered that far from being a mere messenger to children, Rogers preached a gospel that grown-ups desperate needed to hear. While the former presidential administration is over, Donald Trump was not the cause of the ideology he promulgated. Rather, he was a manifestation of a larger trend in America. And the disturbing attitudes he represented have not gone away with a new presidential administration. So Roger's message remains a helpful antidote. In reading and watching the recent works that have delved, in, delved into Roger's legacy, I have found great solace, both on a personal and societal level. 
I hope today to share some of that solace with you, and not just solace, but inspiration for the road ahead. Fred Rogers grew up in the 1930s in the small industrial city of Latrobe, Pennsylvania, the son of literally the richest man in town, his father being the owner of not one, but several factories. His family's ardent Presbyterian faith, along with the spirit of noblesse oblige among some capitalists of that era, inspired a generous philanthropic spirit in his parents that was formative in Fred's upbringing. Fred was a chronically ill child and his mother was overprotective. Instead of playing outdoors with other children, he spent much of his young years in bed or indoors, making up stories in his imagination and acting out those stories with puppets. His wealth, his separation from other children and the fact that he was overweight made him a target of bullying. While Fred's parents loved him unconditionally, they were products of the Victorian era of child rearing when children were to be seen and not heard. And they discouraged Fred from displaying emotion, advising him that the best way to handle bullying was to not let on that it bothered him. Fred turned to the piano as an outlet for his emotions, making angry or sad sounds to express his feelings of resentment and isolation. Despite his troubled childhood, Fred came into his own as a confident high schooler, participating in student government and theater. His love of the piano led him to become a music major, but his own childhood experiences left him with an intense interest in child development, and his family's deep Presbyterian faith inspired in him a desire to become an ordained minister. But in 1951, Fred postponed his seminary enrollment because of a new invention, television. He was appalled that such a powerful new medium was being used in degrading and slapstick ways, quote, literally throwing pies in one another's faces. At that early stage, he sensed that through television, he could bring together his love of music, his call to ministry, and his interest in child development to do something really worthwhile for children. Through his father's connections, he landed first a job at NBC and then at Pittsburgh's nascent public television station, where he gained experience in TV production, including programming for children. He also enrolled in seminary part-time where he became deeply involved in Pittsburgh's Arsenal Family and Children's Center, the site of groundbreaking research and theory in child development, involving such great pediatricians as Benjamin Spock and T. Barry Brazelton, psychologist Eric Erickson, all under the guidance of Dr. Margaret McFarland, who became a kind of guru to Fred, as well as a chief advisor to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The crux of the Arsenal Center's philosophy was that children, far from being miniature adults, had unique socio-emotional needs, and that socio-emotional learning was nece a necessary foundation without which no other learning could adequately take place. Or, as Fred put it, a love of learning has a lot to do with learning that we're loved. It was this philosophy that Fred brought to his television ministry a ministry ordained with some reluctance by the Presbyterian Church. But to Fred, his television work was a sacred task. He said, when I look at the camera, I think of one person, not any specific person, but one person, the space between the television screen and whoever happens to be receiving it. I consider that very holy ground. A lot happens there. I hear that quote a little bit differently than when I wrote the sermon now that we're on Zoom church. If Fred preached a sacred gospel to children, a gospel that is relevant to adults today, what were its tenets? A first and simple tenet would be slow down. Neighborhood producer Margie Whitner, Whitworth quoted a former director who said, if you take all the elements that make good television and do the exact opposite, you have Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. In the medium of TV that thrives on speed and excitement, Fred was uniquely unafraid of silent airtime, taking time to feed his fish or watch a turtle cross a grassy patch. And Fred's pacing was just as unique off camera, so much that his friends and co-workers called it Fred time. Uh, described by one this way, whenever one sat down to talk with him, urgency seemed to dissipate. 
Discussion proceeded at a measured, almost otherworldly pace, and the deepest feelings and thoughts were given patient attention. In a world where we are connected to devices almost 24-7, sometimes multiple devices at once, always multitasking, Fred reminds us to take our time and pay attention. Another tenet of Fred's religion is inclusivity. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood first aired in 1968 amidst fierce racial conflict in this country. In the show's first week, Fred hosted a visit from a Black school teacher, Mrs. Saunders, and an interracial group of students to demonstrate that here in the neighborhood, children of all races played together. Soon after, he invited Black opera singer Francois Clemens to play Officer Clemens, a recurring character on the show. Clemens reflected, I have always felt policemen were the most dangerous people in the neighborhood. So to have me playing a police officer, I was tremendously hesitant. Yet Fred insisted and Officer Clemens was born, the first recurring role for a black actor in a children's TV program. In a famous episode in 1969, when public swimming pools had become flashpoints in the conflict over integration, Fred, invited Clemens to remove his shoes and bathe his feet with Fred in a wading pool in his onset front lawn. Fred was equally inclusive of individuals dis with disabilities. In a memorable episode from 1981, Fred hosts Jeff Erlanger, a 10-year-old boy in a wheelchair, who explains matter-of-factly to the television audience how a tumor made him quadriplegic at age four. Then he and Fred sing the song, It's You I Like, together. Fred had a learning curve when it came to inclusivity of the LGBT community. Francois Clemens was also gay. While Fred was always personally accepting of Clemens' sexuality, he urged Clemens not to come out publicly in the show's early years, feeling that the show's sponsors would not approve and fearing that Clemens' status as a black role model could be jeopardized if his sexual orientation caused a scandal. Yet with time, Fred evolved even to welcoming Clemens to bring his gay friends to visit the studio. In 1993, Fred reprised the waiting pool episode with Officer Clemens. When he ended the show with his usual line, I like you just the way you are, Clemens heard the line differently and was prompted to ask, Fred, were you talking to me? And Fred said, yes, I have been talking to you for years, but you heard me today. Clemens reflected. It was like he was telling me I'm okay as a human being. That was one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had. Ironically, the public often jumped to the conclusion that Fred was gay because of his gentle persona. And this gentle persona often drew criticism that he was a sissy or weak. But as his associate e Elliot Daly said, Fred is one of the strongest people I have ever met in my life. So if they're saying he's gay because that's a surrogate for saying he's, he's weak, that's just not right because he's incredibly strong. Tom Jund, the hotshot journalist won over by Fred during a series of interviews for Esquire said, I think that anybody who looked at Fred looked at somebody they couldn't compare with anybody else. That was one of the things I responded to. I definitely saw another way of being a man. In the Me Too era, when so many in society are condemning masculine behavior, behaviors that have been decidedly harmful, while others are clinging desperately to old stereotypes of machismo, isn't another way of being a man, a way that encompasses a man's strength along with his capacity for care and nurture, exactly what many today are looking to explore? Whole person masculinity may be another tenet of Fred's gospel that adults are craving today. Yet another tenet of Fred's faith is, what is mentionable is manageable. A core value that Fred learned from Margaret Mc McFarland and the Arsenal Center was that children could learn to cope with different difficult emotions if given a safe, structured environment in which to talk about them. And such a safe, structured environment was what Fred created on the show. With a predictable opening and closing routine involving singing while changing his shoes and sweater, Fred set the parameters of each television visit. 
and more importantly, the trolley ride set the boundaries of each visit to the neighborhood of make-believe. Within the neighborhood of make-believe, each puppet acted out different aspects of the child's psyche. King Friday, the urge to be bossy and in control. Lady Elaine Fairchild, the tendency to have mean thoughts. And Daniel Striped Tiger, the child's most intimate doubts and fears and the alter ego of Fred's childhood self. Actress Betty Aberlin, dubbed Lady Aberlin in the neighborhood, acted as the parental figure mediating between them. And within the neighborhood of make-believe, Fred engaged some of the toughest issues, real life, uh, real life issues children and society faced. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood debuted during the Vietnam War, and Fred addressed the fear of war, with King Friday building a border wall around the neighborhood and arming for conflict against people who wanted to change things. Lady Aberlin, X the Owl, and Henrietta Pussycat send the king messages of peace attached to balloons to persuade him to abandon his bellicose ways. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was the only children's television program to address the subject of Robert F. Kennedy's murder, with Daniel Tiger asking Lady Aberlin what assassination means. And it was not just social conflict that Fred helped children mention and manage, but their existential fears as when Daniel Tiger wonders aloud whether he is a mistake. Production team member Hedda Sherapan recalls, sitting in the studio that day, I said to myself, I can't believe Fred had the courage to put that into words. Daniel sings his doubts and Lady Aberlin replies in song, reassuring Daniel that he is lovable. But the song doesn't end there. It ends with a duet, Daniel's doubts and Lady Aberlin's reassurance in counterpoint. Sherapan said, and I thought to myself, thank you, Fred, for reminding us that it's not so easy to quiet doubt, but make it a duet so that it's not just your fears, but you'll hear my support. Fred addressed tough issues and offered no easy solutions except the faith that what is mentionable is manageable. And how many adults have left difficulties unmanaged because of the fear of speaking of tough talk topics how many have engaged in numbing behaviors rather than confronting difficult feelings within themselves? How many workplace or marital conflicts have festered into major problems because the parties involved would rather not speak of them? How many problems in society has society failed to solve because it seemed easier to pretend the problems did not exist? It's Lady Aberlin's reassurance to Daniel Tiger of his worth that represents the cornerstone of Fred Rogers' gospel. Fred himself summed it up in his testimony to Congress in defense of public television. This is what I give. I give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique. I end the program by saying, you've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. But this radical acceptance did not stop with children. Fred affirmed the inherent worth and dignity of the many adults who entered his life too. He gave commencement speeches to young adults. In one near the end of his career, he explained what he meant when he said, you are special. What that ultimately means, of course, he said, is that you don't ever have to do anything sensational for people to love you. It was this acceptance that Clemens spoke of when he finally heard Fred telling him and he liked him just the way he is. It was this acceptance that undergirded Fred's decades long friendship with a locker room attendant at the athletic club where he took his daily morning swim. It was this acceptance that made him slow down to Fred time to listen to the story of a homeless man on the street when he stopped to give him some money. It was this acceptance that won over Tom Junid, who admitted that Fred probably took his invitation to be interviewed because I think he wanted to minister to me. Junid reflected, Fred was about bringing grace to people's lives, everybody that he met, I can tell. And more amazingly, and through much greater difficulty, against much higher odds, through the medium of television, a graceless medium if there ever was, was one, Fred insisted that this could be a medium of grace. That's revolutionary. 
Paradoxically, Fred found it difficult at times to extend the same acceptance that he extended towards others to himself. He was famously a perfectionist who pushed himself towards exceptionally high standards and who agonized for weeks over his speeches for public engagements. According to his wife, Joanne, he didn't know how to take a vacation without having an agenda. Margie Whitmer remembers that Fred was reluctant to share his own vulnerabilities. He wanted kids to talk about their angry feelings, their sadness or their insecurity, you know. In other, in, you know, in ways he protected his own. When different writers would come in to interview him for articles, they would often walk out and say, he interviewed me. What I find most poignant though, are the doubts that Fred expressed those closest to him during the weeks before his death. Joanne Rogers remembers, before he became comatose, he said, do you think I'm a sheep? We knew what he was talking about because he had been reading the Bible about the last days with the judgment. And I think there was the need always there for being loved, for being capable of being loved. There was a little silence and then I said, Fred, if ever there was a sheep, you're one. In this exchange, it is as if Fred has become Daniel Stripe a tiger, his childhood self, and Joanne has become Lady Aberlin, trying to reassure him that he is lovable, despite the nagging gap that is always there. What I take personally from Fred are two lessons. The first is that whoever you are, your uniqueness can serve the world. In a commencement speech, Fred recounted, I'll never forget the sense of wholeness I felt when I finally realized what I was. Songwriter, telecommunicator, student of human development, language buff, but all those things and more could be used in service of ch children's healthy growing. The directions weren't written in invisible ink on the back of my diploma. They came ever so slowly for me and ever so firmly I trusted they would emerge. All I can say is it's worth the, dis the struggle to discover who you truly are. And for Fred, it did not matter what role you had in society, whether exalted or humble, you can still serve the world. Fred came out of retirement after 9-11-2001 to give a message to the country. In it, he said, no matter what your particular job, especially in our world today, we are called to be tikkun olam, repairers of creation. Thank you for whatever you do, wherever you are, to bring joy and light and hope and faith and pardon and love to your neighbor and yourself. The second lesson I take from Fred personally is the message is, is that the message that you most need to hear yourself may be the message you can most effectively bring to the world. Fred, on his deathbed, still asking whether he was a sheep or a goat, had already given the answer so many times over to his viewers and listeners. I only hope that at the end, he was able to, like Clemens did that day in 1993, finally hear his own words. Quote, some days doing the best we can may still fall short of what we would like to be able to do, but life isn't perfect on any front and doing the best with what we have is the most we should expect of ourselves or anyone else. Tom Juno reflects, he had a singular vision of kindness and love, but a question I think of a lot in terms of Fred is whether his attempt to influence America succeeded or not. When we look around in American society today and see a stunning lack of kindness and love, we may be tempted to a similar pessimism about Fred's legacy. In his later years, Fred felt pessimism about his own impact. Margie Whitmer remembers that when called upon to address the nation during the first Gulf War in 1990, and again after 9-11, Fred wondered aloud what good it would do. Whitmer, rem Whitmer remembers thinking to herself, it's not up to you to save the world, but you can certainly help people get through this time. I think the fact that so many who still believe in love and goodness are turning to Fred's wisdom in this dark hour, that nearly two decades after his death, 
His legacy still has the power to inspire hope. This is the measure of his success. I'll close with these words Fred spoke over 20 years ago. Let's take the gauntlet and make goodness attractive in this so-called next millennium. That's the real job that we have. I'm not talking about Pollyanna-ish stuff. I'm talking about down to earth, actual goodness. People caring for each other in a myriad of ways rather than pe people knocking each other off all the, all the time. What changes the world? The only thing that really changes the world is when somebody gets the idea that love can abound and be shared. For Fred, for ourselves, for our children and their future, let us take the gauntlet. Amen. Blessed be. Namaste.